over to the man himself. Thanks very much. Uh, thanks very much for coming. Um, so as Javid said, this is a, a pen testing war story. I mean, this presentation sort of evolved as I was writing it, as these things tend to. Um, so we're starting off with a war story um, with about a web application that had um, Excel export um, and the vulnerabilities that that can present. Um, that in itself is not particularly new. Um, what was interesting about this is the it was a very restricted environment uh, in which I was doing this test. It was very locked down. You weren't allowed a pen test laptop. So it was like, how did I manage to achieve that uh, with just some basic tools? Uh, and then about the last third of the talk is really about where we can go from there and sort of taking the generic case of web application uh, Excel exports. Um, is there any way that we can cut down on the number of user warnings? So we'll sort of, uh, which you know, I'll explain along the way. So uh, where do these user warnings come from and how can we um, try and manipulate our payloads to try and cut those down? So I think there's a little bit of something for everyone really. So just a quick who am I? So I've been in computer security for quite a while. A uh, fraction of which I've been a pen tester and a fraction of that I've been at NCC. And if you can solve those equations, then you'll, you can figure out what those numbers are. And then you'll understand why I like to kind of keep it a bit quiet, um, because the numbers are quite large. Um, so, uh, yeah, I've been to Slough. Uh, <laughs> and uh, I was here two years ago as well. I did a, a talk about OpenSSL, so I don't know if any of you saw that. Um, essentially, it was about how to manually check for uh, results that you get from tools um, concerning TLS and SSL and how you can actually make sure that they are um, true positives um, using OpenSSL and like. So I've got a blog, explorsecurity.com, and that's my Twitter handle. So as I said, this is based on a true story, um, and any sim similarity to uh, actual events is completely intentional. Um, obviously, I've changed some technical details, um, done a bit of obs obfuscation and stuff. So if you can actually identify anything, then please keep it to yourself um, and let me know and then I'll we'll just cut that out of the slides and edit the video. Um, but uh, we should be good to go. So what's, uh, by way of an agenda, uh, this is what, uh, what we're going to do. Is I'm going to take you from the steps. So from CSV to CMD is essentially we've got a web application that does Excel export. How do we go from there to command execution on victim users? Um, I then just wanted to do as a proof of concept for the report that I was writing something you know, better than the equivalent of an alert one. So, um, so I sort of grabbed some hashes of the victim user and, and had a go at cracking them. So that's from CMD to QWERTY. So none of that is particularly difficult. Um, but what was, what, what was difficult about this particular engagement was the, was the environment. Uh, we weren't allowed to bring any pen test laptops in. We had um, domain user accounts. So with those kind of restrictions, it made life a bit more difficult. So that actually forced me to sort of get into the nitty gritty of the topic, and um, uh, and that's what I'm presenting, you know, today for uh, for information. And then at the end, there, as I say, can we improve the attack? Um, you know, can we make it uh, uh, more seamless so that users don't have to accept so many warnings? So this is a big, big, big company. Um, the application was internal. Um, this is why there were all the restrictions about the testing. So it was internal app, web app, IS6, classic ASP, kind of like the beginning of casualty, really. Um, there are a lot of problems with this, um, uh, and much more severe problems than what I'm going to lay out here, uh, you know, secret injection and the like. Um, but I'm only going to focus on one. Um, so the Excel export was, this is a financial um, application. So you know, you'd sort of uh, mess about and, and plug out some data, you get a page of results, then you say, please export this to Excel, it would, it, would, it would download an Excel file. Except, in this case, it didn't. It did it in a horribly complex way. It actually returned some JavaScript to the, to the browser, which, which compiled a post. That posted back up to the web app, and that returned you an Excel file. So in fact, the contents of the uh, Excel file were going back, forth, back, forth. It was, it was disgusting. And just to give you an idea, that's like that's a snippet of the final post. So basically, the, the, the entire Excel file was going was already at the client. It was sort of going back up to the server to be returned back as an Excel file. It was, it was disgusting. So you know, this is a pretty extreme example of how Excel export works. But you see Excel export in quite a few different web apps out there. So the principles that I'm talking about apply you know, more generally. There's, there's nothing particular here that, that only applies to this particular condition, set of conditions. So let's imagine a request, simplified request there, where you, you're, you're doing your Excel export and, you, and you've got some data that you've got control over, um, just a simplified version here. And you, what's returned is, um, uh, a, uh, in this case, a, an XLS file. So several things to, to, to point out there. Obviously, the first point, critical risk, is the misspelling of output. Um, so obviously, that goes straight in the report. Um, then you've got uh, HTTP. This is uh, um, HTTP as well. It is an internal app, but obviously you're going to raise it. 
Um, the content type was, was wrong as well. So there's the potential there, you might think, for some cross-site scripting. Because if your hello world is in fact, you know, script alert and all that, you might be able to do something there. Unfortunately, because of the content disposition header, that's going to force it to be a, a download. And so actually, practically speaking, that doesn't really work. Um, and cache control as well. Um, often I find in web apps that where you get the caching control headers are, are, are generally pretty good. Um, so in other words, you know, it's not being stored um, by the browser. Downloads can, can, can fall foul of, of, of bad caching headers. So pay particular attention to that if you're looking at web apps and everything. It kind of looks all right from a caching point of view. If there's file download, have a close look at that because that's often uh, done incorrectly. So attack scenarios then in this particular case. Um, you can spoof data. You can basically produce an arbitrary Excel file. Um, so this is just a, for, for interest, really. You know, you, you could basically force an Excel file on someone that contained data of your choosing. So you could deceive them into thinking that you know some sales report was you know some sales period was better than it actually was. I was just there for information. Um, in this particular case, you could have a go exploiting Excel vulnerabilities as well, which I'll come to in a second. The main thrust of this talk is about OS command execution. So what do I mean by exploiting Excel vulnerabilities? So um, what I did here is just send a request uh, which contained every single value, single byte value, all 256 possible values up to the server to see what would happen, and back came 255 of them. Um, so essentially, you, you know, that means that you could craft an Excel file that could contain binary content, and so potentially, you, you, you know, you could exploit a problem with someone's um, Excel out of date Excel uh, instance, and 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 uh, you know, get up to mischief there. So it was just there for interest. Turns out it's much easier to get command execution on the victim anyway because of something called DDE, Dynamic Data Exchange. Now this is an old Microsoft technology uh, and allows applications to um, talk to each other. The security risks of this were published um, in 2014, a couple of years ago, by Albino Wax, James uh, Kettle, who, I don't know if he's here, James, are you here? Or maybe he's hiding. Um, but uh, so this, this particular aspect of it is not particularly, uh, is, is not novel. So let's consider um, a different example with our Excel export here, where instead of hello world, we've got this, this field here, which decodes to equals CMD, pipe, uh, forward slash K, IP config, bang, and then a cell reference. Now you often see this cell reference in, in, um, uh, on web, pa web pages that are discussing this problem. In fact, it, it's irrelevant. It, that could be foobar. It, 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 doesn't, it doesn't really matter in this particular context. Um, so the breakdown of that is that you've got a service or a program, a topic, um, and what's called an item. Now, these are sort of DDE-specific uh, terms. So the point about DDE is that you can basically send a message. It's basically a messaging system that, they, that, the, app, that the operating system handles for you. So you've got one application here, one application there. They can talk to each other using this messaging system. So that if you like, there's a kind of API between them, and this is what, what these topics are. Um, so when, in terms of uh, Excel, what that is doing is, is trying to um, locate a DDE service called CMD with that particular topic and that particular item, but that DDE fails because there is no such thing, and so what Excel does is try and run that command for you. So we'll look at, uh, look at that in, in, in more detail. So the warnings that you, that you get, when you download one, uh, um, an Excel spreadsheet that has this equals CMD, this kind of DDE payload, they're not, Excel is not, um, uh, not stupid in that regard. It knows that something is up. In this particular case, um, I, I actually got a format warning because this was an XLS file and I had complete control of the whole spreadsheet. So I was returning like a CSV format inside a .xls. So Excel was actually, first of all, complained about the fact that there was a different file format. Now, if you get through that warning, you get another security notice about links. These, that link is, is, is relating to the, um, to, the, to the DDE call, saying, you know, what do you want me to do with that? And then finally, you get the uh, remote data is not accessible. Now, I don't know if you've ever sort of thought about these, what these actually mean, if you've, if you, if you've, if you've had a go at doing this uh, kind of exploitation yourself. So Excel is complaining there because the DDE, DDE link call fails. There is no you know, CMD um, service that's, uh, that's running. So it says, can't get the data. What, uh, best I can do is just run this thing. You know, what, that, that, what do you want me to do? So again, there's, a, there's, a, there's another warning. And these are the warnings that we're going to look at at the end of the presentation and see where they come from and see if we can sort of cut them down. So um, one advantage for our attacker is that the, the user is downloading it for themselves. So it, you, you kind of already, you know, this is like a stored payload, you know, so you, you've managed to upload some malicious data to this web application. Um, you know, the name of a, 
um, of, a, of an employee or something like that. And then someone a, a month later downloads an Excel export of, of that. So they're doing it voluntarily. You know, you've got that to your advantage. You know, that, that person has requested that data themselves. It's not been pushed on them. That's the beauty of stored payloads, uh, you know, like XSS. So the command execution. Um, so there it is, there's the cell equals cmd uh, slash kip config and you just obviously the slash k just persists the command window just for this screenshot. Um, uh, otherwise it actually runs quite nicely. If you have forward slash c in there so it just runs the command and exit, it runs in a very minimized way. You, can't, you, you wouldn't even notice it, uh, which is quite nice. Um, so this is like the equivalent of, a, of an alert one in XSS. You know, let, let's see if we can do something better with that. So because I was on the inside, I thought it might be quite interesting to examine some like some SMB style um, uh, abuses. So one thing is that I could run an arbitrary command by uh, on a network share, and of course that network share is sitting on the uh, attacker's machine. Um, and the one I decided to have a look at, um, just because it was a bit more challenging, was to to grab domain user credentials. So you can imagine that everyone who exports this particular set of malicious data, you know, is having their domain credentials swiped. And by by swiped, I mean you know collecting the NTLM v2 hash, uh, which is part of the uh, process of connecting to a network share. So obviously an ISP you know, would block or should block these kind of ports from going out. If this was a uh, web app that was available to the, to the public at large, you know, that kind of thing you know, shouldn't really work. But I was on the inside, remember. Uh, so that's what I had a, had a go at. Now normally you, know, you might fire up something like Responder or Metasploit and it would sort of do all this magically and you know, it would be great. But I didn't have a pen test laptop. I only had a domain user account. But, and this, is, this doesn't normally happen on Pentest when things go your way, there was another corporate workstation which had Wireshark on it. Um, um, so, uh, I was able to sort of, that then became my attacker machine. So I had Wireshark running, um, and that became the attacker uh, machine. So the, the victim connected to that, and Wireshark obviously sniffed the SMB you know, style connection. So straight away you get the domain and username uh, uh, for free that Wireshark's pulled out. So let's have a look at some of these, um, um, well we'll have a look at some of those messages uh, later and, and, and what they contain. So I had, I had my Wireshark capture of an NTLM v2 exchange and I needed to know what I needed to pull out in order to, uh, to crack it with, um, you know, with John or, or, or Hashcat or whatever. Now because I knew the password in this case, because I was the victim, and I was just trying to do this for a proof of concept. I didn't need any sort of heavyweight um, cracking going on. I just chose John just randomly. You know, there was, there was no real reason to sort of send this to a GPU rig because I knew the password. So I just went to um, uh, Pentest Monkey and looked at the Hashcat, uh, sorry, the John format. So um, there it is at the bottom if you can't read uh, uh, the screenshot. So you've got the username, the colon, and a set of dollar delimited fields. So everything in red is an unknown at this moment, and what's in green is a known, and that is just a constant, uh, net NTLM v2. So I already know from Wireshark, just looking at the high-level um, uh, packet capture, what the uh, username and, and domain is, so I can pop that in straight away. Um, just call it domain, doesn't really matter. So I've now got half of what I need. What about the other half? What is this challenge? HMAC, MD5, and blob. And this is not normally, not normally something you'd need to look at because, you know, Responder or whatever is just doing it for you. But I had to sort of go in deep dive here. So what is this NTLM business about? Well, it's challenge response. Um, the, first, uh, um, the first sort of command is like a, uh, a negotiation. Uh, it's a bit like sort of SSL where you're just sort of sending up some, some parameters. Um, you then get a challenge come back from the server uh, as well as an agreement of what parameters are going to be used for the chat. And then the, and obviously the last bit is the response, and it's the response which contains uh, some maths, which includes some calculation involving the password, and it's that that you're, you know, that, that you're, that's what you're attacking. So NTLM versus NTLM v2, just, you know, our background, and so NTLM is using the MD4 algorithm, and DES, and that's sort of, that's known to be weak because of null bytes, and that's probably something you've seen before, you can look up. But we're in NTLM v2 land, and that uses HMAC MD5, and that's, which is a little bit stronger, and there's a lot more that goes into the computation of the hash. Um, there's, it's more than just the password and the challenge. There's all sorts of timestamps, and, and, and that is known, <laughs> technically speaking, as the blob. Um, so let's see where those actually are in Wireshark. This is what I actually had to do. You know, go, into that, that, go into that capture file and pull these things out uh, manually. So to get to the, to, to the focus of, if, if, if you've ever looked at an SMB exchange in Wireshark, it's just horrible. I mean, it's just, there's just packets and packets and packets. So you can quickly get to where you need to go with this NTLM SSP Wireshark filter. 
So this is the type 1 message, and there's actually nothing really of interest in terms of cracking hashes. What it does leak is information about the client. It's telling you that it's Windows 7, uh, telling, telling you that the client machine, your victim machine, is a Windows 7 machine. Other than that, not that useful. So the type 2 message is the response from the server. That's the thing that contains the challenge, and, so the, and, and there it is. So NTLM server challenge, that's our challenge, that's that one of our fields filled in. There's also some clues there that we're talking about NTLM v2 because of some of the other things that, that, um, that are in this, uh, in, in, in this packet. So there we are. So we've got our challenge. That's, that's from the second uh, packet. Uh, and you can just quickly get that out of Wireshark um, with, um, with a few right clicks. So what about this HMAC MD5 and the blob? Well, unsurprisingly, they're in this third message. Um, so there's some more clues that we're, we're looking at NTLM v2 here. Um, because there's like a client challenge, which is unique to NTLM v2. Remember, the, ch the, the challenge that we're after is a server challenge. This is a client challenge of no use here, but it just allows that two-way process. We can spot here that, the, the, that all the LM-style hashes are, uh, are blanked out because, you know, obviously this is a Windows 7 machine. There's no LM business going on. Um, there's the domain and the, and the username, so, um, which is what Wireshark pulled out of that high, with that high-level summary. So we've got... Um, this is our type 3 message. When we break open this um, section here, the NTLM response, um, Wireshark nicely tells us that it is NTLM v2, and inside there is our hash, the HMEC MD5, and everything after the hash, assuming you can see this mouse, yep. everything after the uh, hash is what's affectionately referred to as the blob. Um, so, so it's easy to pull this out from, um, from Wireshark. So, you know that you're doing this correctly if you ever have to do this manually because it starts 01010000. zero um, so, so there we are. So we've managed to pull this out without Responder, without Metasploit, just by a bit of sniffing. Uh, now we have everything we need. So let's pop it into, into John. And uh, it didn't crack. Now remember I knew the password, so it should have cracked. Pop it into Hashcat. Didn't crack. Recovered zero of one. Eh, okay. So uh, remember that this is on site, and you know uh, there was time pressure to be there, and I had an awful feeling that it was going to be one of those reports that may have had the phrase "an attacker with more time and resources." Now, if you're a consumer of pen test reports rather than the generator of them, if you ever see the expression "an attacker with more time and resources," that means that the tester was not late enough to do the job. Um, <laughs> there are other key phrases in pen test reports as well, and if you want to know what they mean, then you, you can talk to me afterwards. Um, but. Uh, Obviously, we didn't want that to be the case. You know, why, what was going on here? Uh, one thing to my advantage is that obviously I didn't need to be on site to do this. I was now cracking it. I had my hash, I had everything I needed. So actually, during some of the reporting time, during the, in the reporting day, I had a bit more of a poke at this and managed to get it working. So the key thing that I pulled out from, from that was, a, was an error. If I actually go back a slide, you can see that Hashcat is actually complaining about something. Not obviously, it's not saying error or something like that. It seems to be having a go, but it says skipping line, that which doesn't sound very good. Why is it skipping a line? And that is actually a fraction of my, uh, uh, of my hash. So I just tried different combinations. Uh, on the Hashcat website, there, is some, there are some test hashes. Uh, I've got a link to it later, um, which is a nice way of just doing a sanity check that, uh, that everything's working okay. So these are, these are hashes that, uh, in all the various millions of formats that you, can, that, you, that, you can, that you can crack using Hashcat. So for NTLM v2, there is a hash for the admin user, and the password is, is password or Hashcat or whatever it says on the page. So that's a known. So if I, put, if I put that hash into Hashcat, it worked. It said recovered one of one. But it didn't work for my hash that I knew the password to. So I then tried the same Hashcat test case with, uh, with John, and that didn't work. So it worked with Hashcat, but it didn't work with John. So this is getting a bit confusing now. So then I threw that, the hash that I, that I had from the pen test job and put that onto our GPU rig that we have in, in, in NCC, um, and that worked. So, so over here in, in, in GPU land, that it cracked. Over here on my machine, it didn't crack. Um, and then eventually, I just tried the... Um, the, the Smith Jer the hash, which is the one that I got from the, out of this job, and, and I tried it with John, but in a different format. I tried it in the Hashcat format, and then it worked. I thought, oh, thank God. Okay, right. I've got my I've got my proof of concept. It, I've managed to crack the hash. That's that's good enough. But um, why were all these mixed results? Let's go through why I was getting these gotchas. Why was I getting these sort of bugs? So it's time to activate this person here. Um, any ideas who that might be? Probably not who you were expecting. 
in a presentation about computer security. Black and white photos. So this is John Stuart Mill, and he's an English philosopher, or was an English philosopher. And in 1843, he wrote a book that basically codified how we do science, really. So how do, how do we actually find out what causes an effect, you know, cause and effect? And essentially, you know, you're trying to control, you've got a controlled environment where you're changing one thing, and you're looking at the effect over here. And he, he sort of classified a series of methods. And it's intuitive to us, but he was the first person to sort of write it down, really. And they're called Mill's methods. So what were the differences in, in between you know, the, the, the hashes that didn't work and the hashes that did work? What were, the, what were the circumstances? Well, for John, as in the Ripper, not the philosopher, um, this is really easy because, as I've already explained, the hash cracked when the format was in this style and the hash didn't crack when it was in this style. And this is the style I got from, from, the, from the cheat sheet. What was confusing about it is that John did seem, was, did seem to be happy with it. When you put this hash here into John, it was saying, loaded the hash, it's NTLM v2, but it just didn't handle it correctly. So to be fair um, to Pentest Monkey, uh, uh, the cheat, if you look at the cheat sheet, it does say, and it, which is quite old, you know, it said, this is originally based on a certain version of John, and I'm not really going to change anything afterwards, um, or you know, don't don't blame me if, it, if if things change. And so that was the what the case. So John uh, was expecting or wanted this, this 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 different format, and that's what seemed to do the trick. So that's kind of easy. So what about hashcat? There's a bit more to it here. So why was it that I couldn't get this thing to um, to crack? So um, on the for the admin, which is the uh, test hash that came from the hashcat website, this cracked um, locally. Um, but my uh, hash that I got on this pen test job didn't. Now, remember, I know both the passwords here. The only thing that I could see that was of significant difference was the size of that blob, you know, all those date, timestamps, all that kind of stuff. So the, the blob over here was much, much bigger than, than, than what was over here. Um, and another difference when I uh, came to cracking the um, uh, smith Jer hash uh, was the, the difference in product. So on the GPU rig, that was using OCL hashcat, and also was running on Linux. Um, I was using just Hashcat locally here, and it was just running on Windows. So actually, that's got two differences um, to it. So I kind of zoned in on this blob, just basically because it said something about skipping line. And I know that this is a much, much, much bigger hash for it to, to deal with. So I got a bit suspicious about that. So I kind of wrote a script to do some an analysis. Um, so this script um, pulls out hashes from um, what Wireshark capture files, but more importantly, it allows you to play around with them. So you can feed this script called catflap, either a capture file or a hash that you've already got from some other, which, you know, basically you're not often going to be using Wireshark to do this. Um, but if you've got a hash from, that you're, you're having difficulty with, this is a way to do some sanity checks. So you feed it the hash file and you tell it the password that you want it to be. So obviously this is a case where you, you've grabbed a hash from somewhere, it's a legitimate hash, it's a, it's a password that you don't know. Um, you just want to make sure whether things are kind of running uh, correctly. So yes, you can feed in the admin uh, hash from the, from the Hashcat website, but as we saw, that doesn't always necessarily correlate with, 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 with the working set of conditions because this one over here didn't work. So this allows you to sort of experiment a bit more because that Hashcat um, test hash um, is obviously you know, fixed. This allows you to actually play around with the other inputs. So in the Hashcat file, you can change the username, you can, you can change the password, uh, you can change the blob and all that, and it will recalculate it. So this allows you to experiment with it, and it's a bit of a more faithful check as well, because rather than using um, the username admin, it is actually going to be using the username that you've pulled out from this, this hash. It is actually going to be using the real blob that came from your, um, from, from your pen test or what, you know, whatever you're doing. So the conditions are much, much closer to the hash that you're trying to crack. So there's a little demo here, just to see what that's about. No, I don't want to. Yeah, that's a good point. Um, yeah, let's go with the help. <laughs> right. Um, so this is the, a Wireshark capture file, and. Um, By putting in that, that uh, filter, NTLM, SSP, we jump straight to the three packets of interest. Um, negotiate, challenge, and authentication. You can see um, it's pulled out the, uh, the, the username and password in this, in this test case. So that's just to sort of show you um, what we're dealing with here. 
So cat flap's going to just take that file and it's pulled out the hash sort of automatically. Um, so you've got the username, uh, NCC, and uh, it's obviously just a set of test conditions. Um, uh, domain laptop, and there's the, there is the challenge. Um, there is the, the, the hash. Um, and this horrible long thing at the end is the, is, is the blob. So let's feed that into, uh, into a file and crack it with John. And it cracks. So that's our, that's our sort of, um, uh, uh, you know, the QWERTY part of the title, if you like. So, so let's try cat flat with a change of password. So just to prove that this isn't just sort of completely fixed. Anyone want to suggest a password that is crackable by John? Because we haven't got hours to sit and wait for it. What would be in a, what's going to be in our standard dictionary file? Anyone? Snowflake. Snowflake. You think Snowflake's going to be in there? Okay, let's try that. No, didn't seem to like that. Um, I'll tell you what. Let's just put... Something like that. So what we're doing here is feeding cat flap um, with the hash and a new password. Um, so it recalculates the hash, uh, the, you know, the, end, the response, if you like, the, the, um, that comes back from the client, as if the password were Brazil. So if you look, this is the original hash. That was the, the, the one that had the uh, password of QWERTY. Um, but otherwise, otherwise be a password that you don't know. Imagine this is the hash that you're targeting. You, and Hashcat has failed, and you're just trying to sort of go, oh, why is this failing? Is, is this something that I'm doing wrong? You could check it by feeding it a password that you know, you know will be in the dictionary file. So what this is doing is taking the username, the blob, the, the challenge, and recalculating the hash to Brazil in this case. And if you look at the file closely, you'll see the only thing that's different is this area here, um, because that's the recalculated response. So we put that into John, and that's cracked quickly, if you put it into Hashcat, it doesn't like it. You see there's a recovered zero of one. So let's now shorten this blob. That, that was the bit that I was zoning in on because that was, that was sort of the obvious difference between the two hashes that were, that were cracking. So let's um, use the same password, Brazil. You can see there that the blob are just cut short. In fact, this is the same number of bytes as the test case in, uh, in, in Hashcat. So, so we've got a much shorter blob. Again, we're setting the password to uh, Brazil. And then if you pop it into Hashcat now, it cracks. So obviously, there is some bug. So that's what I discovered. So Hashcat had a, bu had a bug, and it wasn't handling these, these blobs properly uh, w when it was above a certain size. And I sort of calculated what that size was, and I, and I issued a, 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 you know, I put in a, um, a request to get it, to get it fixed. It actually came up with a flag of new feature, which I didn't really quite understand because it seems to be a bug to me. But anyway, there we go. So, you know, I knew that it didn't affect OCL Hashcat. It doesn't, act, as it happens, I feel much, much later found out, like um, sort of the other day, um, that, um, that it doesn't work on, uh, sorry, that it didn't affect Hashcat on Linux either. So there's a very small footnote there because you've just been watching a, a demo of Hashcat apparently running in Linux. Well, I sort of had to fudge that bit. Um, <laughs> But promise me, I promise you, it does actually. If you were to run that on Windows, it's um, it, you know you would you would see that that uh, that that doesn't work. So it turns out that old John Stuart Mill was right there. I was looking at two differences there that it was it wasn't working with um, with Hashcat. It was working with OCL Hashcat, and also the platform made a difference as well. So um, so there we are. So that sat there for a little while, and then Hashcat three turned up and it got fixed and disappeared. So 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 that does seem to have been taken into account and. And fixed, which was cool. So that is sort of explained sort of what, what was wrong with my, um, and it wasn't my fault as such, you know, that was exp explained what was wrong with the, uh, with, with the cracking operation. So um, there's some NTL MV2 theory, there's some sort of bits and bobs, and uh, this is sort of something that just grew out of interest. And, and I wanted to take it further for this, for this presentation. Can we cut out some of those warnings? This is essentially about can we, can we play around with this Excel export? Um, you know, we've seen that we can grab a hash and, and some complications with that scenario. But more generally speaking, if we want to get some command execution on the victim, you know, what can, what can we do? And, and, and can we make it more streamlined from the uh, attacker's point of view? So the standard sort of warnings that come up. 
when you um, have an Excel spreadsheet that contains one of these references, like equals, CMD, pipe into something, you know, whatever. First of all, you get a protected view warning. And this is because it's coming from the internet. The file has been downloaded, coming from the internet, and it's not trusted. So you get that warning come up. The next warning you get kind of varies. It depends where you are. So that warning in the background there with the yellow bar, that's kind of the first warning that, that you might get, um, where it's sort of suspicious of the content. It knows that you might be sort of you know, calling malicious programs, so it gives you a warning there. The second warning, the sort of 2B warning there, that's slightly different. You see, it hasn't got a security warning, you know, quite so. It's not quite so. It's not that one that you get on the bar of Excel. It's, it's subtly different. That's saying that, that you usually get that kind of warning when the first warning has been previously accepted. Um, and you're, you're running the file again, and it, it realizes that you've still got links, and you want, you want to run them again. So you get some different warnings there, depending on, on, on the context. And the last warning, which I've already explained, you know, do you want to run cmd.exe? You get that warning because the, your the equal CMD, which is, it treats as a DDE call, fails um, because there is no um, a DDE s um, service listening uh, called CMD. So it then offers to, to, to run that. So what can we do about these warnings? Well, the first thing to mention is that we know that users click through warnings. So um, these are some stats from uh, sort of NCC's sort of Piranha tool, which is a sort of in-house tool. Um, that uh, is also available as a, uh, as a service as well to a limited extent, where, where we can do some red teaming and phishing and, and, and things like that. So I, managed, I asked someone to sort of pull out some stats, and um, the stats were pretty promising from, a, from, a, um, from the attacker point of view. So th the difference here is between people who have opened the spreadsheet and people who have opened the spreadsheet and must have clicked some warnings. The fact that there is a difference there means that the thing definitely didn't auto-execute. Someone has definitely sort of clicked OK. We obviously don't have any visibility as to what those warnings were, but we know that something happened. So in a few different cases here, you know, 70%, 75%, 44%, you know, it's always a little bit of a, uh, you know, a lottery as to who, who, who you're up against. Um, so these people are clicking through warnings. So to an extent, do we have to worry about the warnings too much? Not all the time. We know that that is a that is an important vector for, for getting stuff um, into organizations. However, it would be nice to, to, to cut down on those warnings. Interestingly enough, I was uh, with someone uh, who, who, who works in uh, uh, at a, a reasonable sized corporation, and I just, as I was preparing this talk, said, let me just have a little look at your Excel settings. Uh, and it was set to that. So <laughs> enable all macros. So sometimes you might be lucky and there may, you know, the, the configuration in the, in the organization may be wide open. And of course, you know, macros is, is, is much more dangerous. And that's an important point here. DDE is not the same as a macro. You could have macro settings to, you know, give me a warning and DDE is not going to sort of trigger that, um, which is quite nice from a, from a red team point of view. So where do these warnings come from? So they are obviously various settings in it. Uh, in Excel. Um, so pr the protected view warnings are coming from the default uh, part, uh, default set of tick boxes there where you know it says if this file looks suspicious then give me a warning and the external content that's these sort of dynamic links that are making DDE calls and, and so forth that's in the external content um, section there and the default there is, is, is prompt and hence the yellow hence the yellow bar. So while poking about I noticed that inside the Excel spreadsheet if you go to data edit links, go down to startup prompt at the bottom, so data, edit links, you get this dialog pop up, go to startup prompt, and the default option was let users choose to display the alert or not, but there was another option at the bottom, don't display the alert and update the links automatically. And I thought, hmm, that's interesting. Um, now this is a property of the file itself, so this property goes with the file, and I thought, this is like a network packet with the evil bit set to off. <laughs> um, you know, so I had a little experiment with this. Turns out it's not quite as good as you, uh, as I hoped. So it is a setting of the property. Uh, sorry, it is a setting of the um, of, the, of the file. It follows the file, but it's only effective if the file has been previously trusted. So you get one warning to say, you know, are you happy with this? Essentially, with this spreadsheet. After that, it doesn't give you any more warnings when you run it again, which is, you know, not not ideal. You could, if you wanted to do like a really low and slow attack, you know, you could have a a, a file. Uh, with the same name, uh, where the first payload was just benign, just didn't do anything, and then you followed it up with something more malicious later on, and that second um, uh, file wouldn't wouldn't have the same warnings on it. Um, 
So where is this being stored? When you accept the protected view, when you accept the security uh, enable uh, content warning, what's happening? Well, it's just entries in the registry, as you might expect. So um, you get an entry, entry here in trust records, you get the name of the file, and some horrible binary blob, I don't know what half of this does. But if you, once you accept the protected warning file, it has this value. Once you accept the security content, uh, you know, sec enable content security warning, then it changes to this. And so that's of interest because only the file name is, is stored. Um, so where you have downloads, if you're thinking about web app export, for example, um, or maybe you're sending attachments or something like that, um, if the file name is static, then that's more of, of, of more interest because if that file, and it could have been obviously completely different content, but if it's been previously trusted, your file will be trusted uh, because it's got the same name. There's no, 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 it's not like it's hashing it or anything like that. It just goes on the name. So once that file, once that file name is trusted, anything afterwards will um, will be subject to less warnings because uh, you, it's as far as it's uh, as Excel and the operating system is, is is concerned, you're happy with that. Even though you've overwritten the content with something else that could be malicious, it's it will just um, to run that. So we're potentially that's a um, that will reduce the number of warnings. I then had a poke about with um, the Excel, the, the file formats as well. Is there something, you know, if you've got a web app that's exporting XLS, is that going to be different to a, a web app that's exporting CSV? And that's not or something you always have control over when you're doing your web app testing because it's, it may just be export a, CV, a CSV and that's it. Um, but there's some, there could be some uh, import into red teaming or, you know, sometimes there may be different options in your web app export. And so I had a little poke around. There wasn't all that much difference. The only thing I noticed was CSV, you didn't get that protected warning um, message. So that first warning, protected view, this is coming from the internet, don't, not happy about this. With CSV, you don't get that. So it's almost like, you know, there's been a d design decision in, in Microsoft that CSV is benign, and we, we know that not to be true. So you get one less warning with CSVs. Um, one thing though is that the CSV can't contain that startup prop, that, you know, that where it says like, I want to auto update my links and, and uh, not be bothered about it, because of, the, because of what it is, just comma separated uh, values, it, it, you can't store that value as, as, part of the, um, as, as part of the file. That's obviously not something that you can do with, uh, with web app export, you know, is, is, to, is to create the file with that setting. But in red teaming, you, you know, you can, where you're crafting an Excel file, you could change the data link properties and, and, and set that. So it may be of use. So I'm kind of switching a little bit between different scenarios where you've got web app export and where you might be sending malicious Excel files. There's a little bit of an overlap in some areas and in other areas there's, there's, there's some differences. The other thing I noticed is that if the CSV format was in an XLS file, so you had a .xls extension, but it was actually in the CSV format. Now this is actually similar to the real pen test job that, uh, that, that was at the top of this uh, presentation. So here, you get a format warning, as you saw, instead of the protected view. So even though it's come from the internet, the protected view warning disappears, and instead you get a format warning, which is a little bit sort of less um, uh, in, in, in your face. Um, you might be more likely to click yes to that. All the formal security warnings actually aren't shown. Um, all the ones that have, you know, the yellow banner, they don't, they don't come up. Um, as a consequence, though, the file can't be trusted because you've got to click those yeses in order for it to appear in the registry. So if you're thinking about a long-term attack where you're following it up with other um, Excel files that, uh, that have more malicious payloads, you know, that's, that's not going to work. So there wasn't really, as it turns out, and this is what research is about, I suppose, you know, that didn't really sort of offer, offer too much. So why don't we have a look at this cmd.exe warning um, as well. What can we do about that? So the first thing I thought about is, well, what, what about if we use some native functions? Now, there's a few here that have already been documented elsewhere. You know, the equals hyperlink, for example, is a way of stealing data. That was in James Kettle's original uh, presentation. So you can create a hyperlink to myevilsite.com, um, add some contents of cells, and if someone clicks that hyperlink, it'll just steal that data and send it off, and, you, you know, you can read it. You can also get some information about the operating system and some bits and bobs as well, if you can grab the contents of cells that you have control over and you put these kind of um, instructions in there, equals info directory, it will tell you about the current directory and uh, to be honest there isn't an awful lot there but it's just there for information here. So something that was new to, I think it's 2013, was the equals web service function. I thought, well that sounds interesting, it's, it's automatically making an HTTP request to you know, an arbitrary site. Unfortunately, I couldn't get it to do NTLM authentication. It doesn't seem to support anything very exciting. You know, I tried 
getting it to uh, you, grab a file, to, to use UNC paths and all that kind of stuff, and it wasn't, it wasn't happy. It looked, it looked fairly locked down to me. Um, but the only thing that I found of interest was that it allows you to steal data without someone clicking a hyperlink. Because equals web service, it will actually automatically go and grab that. So uh, the, at the top there, you've got a hyperlink, someone's got to click. In this equals web service, it's a way of stealing data automatically. Um, the only other function that I could see that just, just you know, sprang out was equals filter XML. Um, and we all know that sort of XML parsing is quite dangerous. Um, I had a very quick poke at it. I wouldn't say it was exhaustive, couldn't see anything, but it's you know, there for interest. So, so in terms of functions that wouldn't produce the CMD or XE warning because they are native to Excel, you know, there wasn't all that much sort of that, I, that, you know, that I could see. So what about alternatives to running CMD or XC? I thought, you know, could we get a process running that a user might sort of trust more? Uh, I just started poking around with stuff that, that would be of interest. Um, you know, whether someone would be happier clicking on a link that had, uh, you know, PowerShell or XC, I, you know, I don't know. But I just sort of had a little poke around to see what you could do. One thing I noticed is that in my setup, and I tried this across various um, uh, different um, versions of Excel and operating systems, um, and when I try and run something like equals PowerShell, um, which obviously isn't a DDE service listening um, in the operating system, so Excel goes, all right, I'll have a go at running this. It says, do you want to run PowerSheet or XE, which sounds like some kind of superhero. Um, and, uh, and that obviously isn't going to work. Um, so you can see it's got that 8.3 8 kind of format to it, isn't it? Um, I saw as, um, a blog posting by um, Andy, I think, uh, at Zephyrfish, and he, and, and he seemed to have got the, the equals PowerShell to, to work fine, but it didn't in my case. So the fact that there are two different conditions there, you've got to be careful of what you're running, because it, it, it could be that, uh, that on the victim machine, uh, if you've got something that's longer than eight characters, .exe, it's going to fail. Um, obviously, you can always run PowerShell by, by invoking it like this with equals CMD, but then we're back to where we started. So I looked at some XE files in the path where the file names were less than 12 characters, you know, and there's plenty of fun you can have. Equals Explorer will open the default browser. Uh, you can schedule tasks. You can pull down, this is Java Web Start, so it will go and grab that and run it. And run DLL32 is an equivalent here, invoking this DLL uh, function is an equivalent way of running CMD, but without it saying CMD. Um, trouble is, for each of these, it, we're still going to get a warning. It's still going to say, do you want to run explorer.exe? Some, you know, they, uh, uh, a user may be happier, more happy with that than CMD, but at the end of the day, we're still getting a, a warning. And we're getting that warning because none of these are actually DDE calls. So my next thought was, well, what, what, you know, what, what, what is natively listening uh, on this sort of DDE um, platform? You know, what can I take advantage of? So I, I found this tool called TCL, Tool Command Language, uh, and it has a sort of DDE client and server package, which I got running. And then I just asked it to list the available DDE services that, are, you know, that the operating system was, was currently uh, supporting with various apps. So a few things popped out, uh, uh, Excel. So Excel itself is, a D, is, is offering a DDE interface. Um, shell, uh, one called um, Folders, uh, one called Progman. So I had a little look at what these, actually, what these actually do. Because if I could make calls to these, then I wouldn't get that warning because Excel would be happy that, it was, that, it, you know, that, the, that the, the call was working. So I thought, well, what can I do with these? So using the DDE client as part of TCL, I had a little bit of a poke. You know, and I found out that you could pull out data, um, which I found kind of interesting, that you have an Excel app over here and a, and a program over here, and this program can read the contents of the worksheet. Um, just, you know, sort of kind of interesting. You could also sort of programmatically from this DDE client tell Excel to run a limited form of macro, um, so you know some uh, some alert, uh, and you can string them together like this. And I thought that was interesting because if you can get macros running, then you know you might be able to get command execution. Um, and but it turns out this macro format is extremely old. I mean DDE itself is very very old, um, and this is in the what's known as the XLM I think it is format. This is like pre Visual Basic. This is macros before VB. This is this is pretty dated. Um, and there's some interesting operations. The most important one was exec. Um, and that is a sort of legitimate uh, macro command in XLM world. But it did not want to work in this case, unfortunately. So that was, that was a bit of a shame. 
So I started looking at some of the other ones. What does this progman thing do, program manager? It seems to control shortcuts and, and, and things like that. So you could, you could, you can, you can, with a DDE call, tell the program manager to create a shortcut. And, you know, you could make it look like something, you know, something else. So here I've just called calc, I've got a, a hyperlink, um, a shortcut called Microsoft Word that actually points to calc.exe. And when you start in your search bar searching for Word, it, you know, it pops up, you know, it pops up in there as an, as an alternative. Um, in terms of folders and shell, these other DDE services, um, you could um, essentially, you know, uh, run a similar attack to what I, you know, what I did in the pen test job, where you're getting it to connect to a network share, and as a result of that, you can steal the uh, NTLM, you know, hashes. But the trouble with all this is that there's sod all documentation. Um, it, it was so so hard to pull anything out at all, um, probably because it's so old. Um, and it's, it's kind of frustrating because you just think there may be something there. Uh, and, uh, you know, you know I, only had, I basically ran out of time. Um, so the other thing I decided was that this, is, this is all very well and good if I can do this using a DDE client. But if I can't get it working in Excel, then the whole thing is pointless. So what happens when we take these DDE calls that are in a DDE client and try and put them in Excel in the format equals service topic, you know, item? So this could save you hours, by the way, if you do decide <laughs> to have a play with this, because this, uh, this really threw me. When I was doing my testing, I was putting in these equals service topic, you know, these kind of DDE calls, and nothing was happening. I thought, well, you know, I don't, why isn't it working? It turns out, for the vast majority, that um, the TCL program, which I happened to have running as my DDE client, seemed to be interfering it with some way. So um, if you are sort of poking around, then just be wary that you may, <laughs> there could be some interference in the messaging system. Um, I don't know why, but, but there you go. As soon as I close my DDE client, it kind of ran again. So, um, so be wary of that if you, if you decide to have a play. Um, so I didn't have all that much luck with some of the things that I was, um, uh, that I just pulled out from my experimentation with the client. So for example, if I tried to take this DDE client, um, DDE call, and put it in a sort of Excel format where you were kind of getting equals folders, app properties, and then trying to feed it some data. It didn't seem to be happy. I tried doing escapes, I tried doing all sorts of things, and I, and I couldn't get it to work. So then I thought, well, okay, what else, what else could I do? So I then found out that the, that DDE client was not telling me about all the services that were listening. You know, there was this progman, Excel, and so forth. It wasn't, it wasn't actually complete. And I pulled out this tool called DDE Spy, which is part of Visual Studio 6. And again, I told you this was old. Um, and if that's running at the time that you're launching applications, it gives you some hints as to what DDE um, API, if you like, they're exposing. So it turns out the browsers are exposing some as well. So iExplore and, and Firefox, and there are some um, methods, although to they're called topics in DDE world. So iExplore is the name of the service, and you know, these are the name of the topics. So I started having a play with that. So I explore that, that that was quite happy working in, in, in Excel, probably because the, the what the well, maybe because the characters that I were using were much simpler. So if you put equals I explore and www open url ncgroup.com, for example, in a spreadsheet, it will just you know you know um, uh, point uh, Internet Explorer to that URL sort of silently in in the background. So similarly, I could do a backslash backslash um, attacker IP network share and grab a hash in, in the same way. You could also try and run an executable, although you just get a, a, a dialogue prompt, almost as if you were downloading the file. And of course, the whole point about this is trying to get rid of prompts. So, you know, that wasn't really too interesting. And I didn't really find a way of getting any command switches in there either. So, you know, that really isn't going to help us. So Firefox offers a similar sort of in, interface. The only thing that I found the difference between the two was a, a topic called get window info. So if you have an Excel spreadsheet uh, that has this as its um, DDE call, equals Firefox, get window info, et cetera, and again, it doesn't really matter what this is, um, it will pull out details of the, uh, of the URL that, that, happened to be, uh, you know, that you happen to be on. So let's do a little bit of a demo with, with some Excel files that are trying to take advantage of DDE. Uh, so somewhere here, so I've just got, imagine this is like a web app export kind of thing. So, so here we have a monthly report, which uh, we're, we're downloading and, you know, saving and what have you. Uh, let's just 
There we are. So we've downloaded monthlyreport.csv uh, and we open that up and uh, nothing very exciting. So this is, you know, this is our sort of standard test case, if you like. So this is our CSV file. So what happens if this is malicious? So we're going to open that. Uh, actually, let's save it. Um, and I've got a copy of it. Sounds working. Uh, there we are. So here we've now overwrote that CSV file uh, with a new one that's malicious. So let's open that up. Um, now, we've got no protected view warning. Uh, so this has come from the internet. We've got no protected view warning because this is a CSV file. Um, but we do have the security warning because it realizes there's some kind of content in there which is active, if you like. So we, we, if we enable that, now you can see back in the background, in the background, the browser has been navigated away to a completely different URL. And obviously the point of this is to do like a phishing exercise. So imagine that you're, you're doing your web app um, export. Um, you can put in a payload which, sort of, which in the background navigates the user to some arbitrary site. That site is our phishing site and is meant to look like the original site. There's the original site, um, but it's got a login prompt there. So you could quite easily be you know, um, downloading a, a malicious um, Excel, format, um, Excel file, uh, running it. You can see there's no, nothing obvious, that there's, a, there's any, any problem. Um, and in the background, you flick back to here, and you think, oh, my session's timed out. Uh, you know, and, you, and you put in your credentials, and, and you're, you're actually giving it to the, to the attacker. So the call there is simply, if you read that, but yeah, so equals Firefox, just using a DDE call. So this time, we're not getting, do you want to run Firefox.exe, because that is a legitimate call. The DDE service was responding, so you don't get the error message. Um, so here we're navigating off. So let's do a, a final demo which is just like if the stars are aligned, if you like. So this is when everything is uh, working correctly. So let's just get Responder running. Uh, yeah, so we see we've got an SMB server on. So let's now download this uh, malicious file. Yeah, replace that and open it. So here we've got a slightly different uh, call in here. And let's go back to our responder. And there you go. So you've got, you've got an NTLM v2 exchange going on in the background with no warnings. Um, and so there is the a very similar um, um, sort of payload to the previous one. Uh, all I'm doing is pointing it to a UNC path. And you can see that uh, it has actually tried to open it in Firefox. That's happened in the background. Um, it's just got a blank, blank page. So without any warning that um, that you're going to do this, um, you, you know, you 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 you're back to sort of stealing hashes. So if I find my presentation, we'll just sort of round this up. So exactly what happened there? Because I got absolutely no warnings whatsoever. Um, so in order to get rid of some of the security warnings, I had to have previously downloaded that file um, with, um, and, and accepted the warnings uh, before. So remember that this needn't have previously been malicious. Um, and uh, this is kind of sort of rather exceptional. Um, the main, um, I think the main warning that you can tackle uh, potentially is the, is the cmd.exe warning. I think that's the one that you've probably got the most control um, over. So what lessons have we learned there? So Excel export is definitely something to be, pay attention to with, with web apps. And I, you know, I, I don't know whether, how many of us are pen testers and, and what kind of background here, but if you're new to it, definitely sort of look that up. Um, CSV is definitely not a benign format. DDE is not the same as macros, so um, Excel files that are being, uh, if you're talking about emailing, um, uh, you know, from a red team point of view, emailing Excel files, um, then uh, if, even if they're catching macros, then you can um, you know, possibly bypass that with using DDE calls. In some cases, it's possible to cut down the Excel warnings. Um, and I, Excel may have more to give in this area. This is kind of work in progress. You know, I got as far as I could. You know, I kind of finished this on Tuesday. <laughs> um, you know, I pushed it as far as I could. You know, unfortunately, there was no like, obvious sort of command execution that I could find. 
but you've seen the principles. You can see that if you are making DDE calls, you don't get warnings um, that, they're, that they're running. And if you can poke the right thing, there may be something more here. Um, so please, you know, go away and explore this. I'm certainly going to have a little poke, more of a poke. This certainly applies to red teaming as well, not just web app export, because you know, ultimately you're trying to get command execution. Um, and just at the end there, um, this is more about the sort of problems I had with cracking hashes. You know, the closer that you can get to developing test cases that match your environment, you know, the, the better. Read errors as well. It's, it's so quickly to, it's so easy to, it can be telling you what's wrong. And you're just so sort of obsessed with the fact that it hasn't actually worked that um, you kind of forget the error message. So a quick word on defense. Uh, the original article um, said that we should prefix the e uh, anything beginning with equals with a uh, with an apostrophe that will cast the cell as text. Um, but we know, and this has actually got a little bit more of a, uh, an uplift sort of in the, in the last couple of months. Um, this, this sort of topic went quite quiet for a while, which is why I decided to talk about it. And then, funnily enough, it sort of popped up again. So um, lots of these different, pay all these different payloads work. So you can see there that we, we've got cells that are working without an equal sign and all sorts of stuff. And it, this is beginning to feel like cross-site scripting blacklisting here. Um, so obviously what we want to do is sort of validate against a whitelist of known, a known good, which should be of, of no surprise. So when the slides eventually make their way to um, the internet, uh, there's a few references and things to, to look at of some DDE, some uh, Hashcat test files, where this cat flap script is, um, and some appendices about how I'm pulling out data from Wireshark and actually how I'm sort of recalculating the NTLM v2. And that's it. So I don't know whether anyone has any, any questions. So I'm not exactly doing a, a root dance here, and <laughs> but there's some. I feel like there's some progress, you know, in, in trying to cut down those warnings, and, th and there may be more. So this is a bit of an open call to people to go and have a look, because I think there may be there may be more to find. It's just so difficult because it's just undocumented. Hello, yes. Yeah. No. So the question was whether uh, I looked at anything other than uh, Excel. No, I've not. I know that Word is also a DDE server. Um, one of the things I was thinking about is whether you could, you could actually leverage, w when Excel opens, whether you could make a DDE call to Excel itself in, in order to sort of get things uh, uh, operating. So it could be that Word has some more interesting um, um, methods, if you like, exposed, you know, topics to use the DDE uh, term. And, and I've not had a look at it, no. No, so that, that could well be something that uh, is, deserves further investigation. Yeah, I did. I think I, yeah, I couldn't see anything. Well, let's say that when I had Outlook running and I ran the DDE uh, services list, it didn't display anything. But as I've, as I've shown, that wasn't exhaustive because that, that wasn't listing, for example, that Firefox had some services exposed. It wasn't listing the, it wasn't listing the Internet Explorer. So I don't really know what's happening in the DDE mechanism, which whether that client was was able to uh, know that those services were running. But obviously, in some cases, that it's not it's not advertising it. So this and of course, you know, how do you research something like that? You know, where you don't even know what's there. It's so, so there may be more to give. I you know I I took it as far as I could in the in the time available. Um, you know, go and have a look. Mm. So, so the question was whether that, how essential was that sort of pipe character? So in, in, in terms of Excel, to get Excel to do a DDE call, that's the format. So you, that you have equals CMD, that's the name, or you know, as we've seen Firefox, for example, uh, and in that case, that doesn't refer to the executable, that is referring to you know, a, um, a, a DDE service. Uh, you then distinguish that with a pipe to say, now, that's the service I want to call. This is the topic that I want to send to it. So I, as far as I'm aware, in terms of DDE in Excel, that pipe is, uh, is essential. The reference escape that I've found Oh, hello, Andy. <laughs> the reference escape No, no, I've not. The only thing is, um, yeah, because I saw that conversation. I mean, he was raising the fact that um, you had other payloads which did, which did other things. You know? So for example, like the equals web service, for example, doesn't rely on a, on a pipe character, but could steal, but could steal data. Um, so as far as I'm aware in terms of DDE, that pipe character is, is essential yeah, in, in Excel. I, I think that's, yeah, that's, that's, the, that's a sort of constant, if you like. 
Hello. Uh, Uh, they, sorry? Uh, right. Um, no. And so the question was like, um, so, so, so can, can we take advantage of uh, IBC dollar? Um, so you mean sort of do a network connection? Yeah. Well, I think I think the I think it's you know the the mechanism that DDE uses is not necessarily. I mean, obviously, to use the term RPC generically, remote procedure call, it is obviously a remote procedure call of some description. But I think the mechanism within DDE world is is very different. Um, um, oh, I see what you mean. I think I, yeah. So you're so you're saying whether whether I could have a client over here. And, uh, and, and I could sort of programmatically poke something over here, on, but, but not on the same machine, but over on the network. I see what you mean. Right, OK. Uh, don't know. <laughs> Didn't get that far. Um, I was. Yeah. Yeah, I'm, I'm not, not that I'm aware. Not that I'm aware. As far as. I've only looked at it locally. I've only looked at sort of DDE running locally because the focus of the presentation. Uh, was about, you know, if you can get something running um, in terms of a, an Excel file that you download from a web app, that's obviously all local, and I kind of kept it with that scenario. I know I've flicked occasionally to, to red teaming and, uh, and the like, but that's the focus. So I've not, I've not looked at that. No, I don't know whether that's possible, to be honest. Mm, please do. Whew. <laughs> Lunch. <laughs>